the my first official act of gaveling us in, I suppose, in the digital age is to start the recording, uh, which is what I've just done. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Nick Wilson speaking on behalf of the broader community of uh, that is bringing together these uh, CHS and SSHA flash talks. Uh, congratulations, especially to those of you who have figured out on your own that the password is lowercase without having to see it tweeted. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but we are here today. Um, so uh, we are here today to uh, in, enjoy, to the extent one can, about a, a very difficult political topic, enjoy uh, a talk on power politics and populism. And uh, it's really two talks. Uh, we are going to be uh, told about two fantastic recent books by, member, by distinguished uh, historical comparative sociologists at the University of Virginia. They are Adam Slez, who is an assistant professor, and Isaac Ariel Reed, who is a professor both in the Department of Sociology. Uh, so we have not flipped a coin, so let's go alphabetically by surname, like they made me do all the time as a Wilson in middle school. Uh, so Isaac, without further ado, please, uh, please tell us what you have to say. Hello, everyone, and um, thanks for listening. Uh, I see the links going out on the chat, and... Um, I'll just uh, get started here. I really um, appreciate being able to do this. And I also just want to say, um, it's so sort of no, it's so nice to see the CHS community together uh, on Zoom, um, kind of uh, inspiring and um, uh, energizing. So um, at the end of the 18th century, um, three revolutions uh, shook the Atlantic world. Uh, these revolutions, among, among many other things, were iconoclastic. They were iconoclastic both in the sense of attacking certain received institutions um, and also in the specific sense of smashing idols. In British North America, for example, um, economically well-off British colonists had spent most of the 18th century buying manufactured goods from England. Many of these goods were imprinted with signs of the king, um, and in being so imprinted, they re reminded the men who owned them that they were both hailed into subjecthood as members of the British Empire, and they thought uh, entitled to certain English or British liberties. Um, these signs of the king and statues of the king uh, in the lead up to the American Revolution as the political elite and to some degree the various populations um, in British uh, North America uh, began to take sides um, uh, as loyalists or, or, or as uh, quote unquote sons of liberty, um, these signs of the king took on additional political significance or weight. And finally, with the coming of the American Revolution itself, statues of King George III were torn down um, all over the areas uh, that eventually became the USA, um, which is to say that there were uh, statue politics in 1770, just like in 2021. Um, now, uh, I think that the significance of this iconoclasm uh, um, is not only a matter of political separation or independence in the case of the American Revolutionary War. Um, uh, and it wasn't even a matter just of a nation's or imagined communities finding their way to self-determination. In fact, in some sense, this is all in inter-imperial politics Shortly after the revolution in the US, the new USA initiated its vast imperial push west across the continent. And the fate of Haiti after the Haitian revolution uh, um, was of course determined by the cross imperial freeze out of the new in newly independent island from international trade and wealth. Furthermore, I would like to say that the attack on kingship in the late 18th century represented by the French Haitian and, and, and American revolutions it was immensely complex because flew through the transatlantic channels of communication, trade and enslavement flowed not only attacks on kingship, but also its defense. 
The possibility of acting for the crown retained great appeal uh, and also provided politically, uh, ent politically entry points for various different projects and various different attempts at profit. Uh, and finally, the fantasy that good and moral kings would rule against their parliaments and liberate various groups um, from their oppression or their perceived oppression was an important part of the complex currents of political culture in the 18th century world. Now, when we back out to uh, our political history, theory, and comparative historical sociology. Hello, Mr. Hey. Isaac. Um, how are you doing? Sorry, can we actually mute? mute? Okay. Uh, I, is my mic working? Guys, is my mic working? I just removed them. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're getting Zoom bombed by children. Okay. I'm um, trying to meet them. Thank you for taking care of that. Sorry. So um, I was on the attack of uh, uh, kingship. Um, so of course, I mean, it's a standard of, of political history that um, uh, the attack on kingship and especially perhaps um, the um, attack uh, in the French Revolution is a turning point in political and cultural history, particularly of Western Europe. But some of the central contrarian and counterintuitive insights of our own field, comparative historical so sociology, emerged to contest the marking of history by the end of kings. Um, for us, the rise of the power of certain monarchs in the early modern world, the early modern Atlantic world in particular, is a symptom of modern state formation. Uh, and sociologists have long argued that the new rulers of France after the revolution uh, merely codified a process of state centralization that had been going on for a long time. So Louis the Sixteenth uh, 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 or Louis Capet may have had the unfortunate uh, uh, end of having his head removed from his body, but uh, it was really Louis the Fourteenth and the Canal du Midi that made modern statist France. And yet we do ask, with Reinhard Bendix, um, the question: Kings or people in the making of the modern age? And I'm going to try to talk about that today. Lynn Hunt wrote a book about the family romance of the French Revolution, and Joan Landis um, attended to kings and aristocratic salons um, in trying to tell the story of the exclusion of female bodies from the public sphere in newly Republican France. Um, throughout all of this has been a question about royal patronage and symbolization and its importance for the political configuration of state and society. And what I'm going to do today is try to present some ways from, from, from my empirical studies for thinking about the life and the death of the king as one way that opens on to the question of populism and state politics, or as I will put it, not, not, not populism technically, but, but the use of the, of the discourse or what I will call the myth of the people in the making of political modernity. So how to think about the death of the king in a transatlantic way informs my reading in, uh, in my book, Power of Modernity, um, of the many private letters and public political pamphlets um, that I studied within networks of high authority in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 17th century, the Colony of Virginia in the 17th century, and the early American Republic in the 18th century. Um, and my, my, my goal and my sort of conceptual method was the following. Uh, um, I, I wanted to explore the discourses and performances that emerged around violent revolt and trouble at the edge of empire. I did not study the American Revolutionary War itself, but rather rebellions at the end of the 17th and 18th centuries um, on either side of the revolution. And my reasoning for doing this was that when political formations falter and violence breaks out, then we see the underlying cognitive, moral, and aesthetic orders that normally provide the hidden background or guardrails of quote unquote normal politics. Liminality reveals regime because when violence creates uncertainty, suddenly everyone in their letters and in their pamphlets, um, including their private letters, becomes a political philosopher, explaining the basis for uh, political order and why anybody should follow the order that they're giving in the letter. Um, so this study um, of the 17th and 18th centuries revealed um, 
also another meaning to kin to kingship. I don't study kingship as a monarchy as a format of government, um, but rather what I was confronted with was the immense utility of the king's second body for the sealing together of principal agent relationships in the organization and conduct of, and pursuit of uh, the organization and conduct of politics and the pursuit of profit in the early modern world. Um, now sociologists have always been interested in delegation, the division of labor in organizations requires it. Um, and many of the uh, core power dyads of sociology, colonizer, colonized, capitalist worker, high level bureaucrat, low level bureaucrat, involve agency problems where the lower part of the dyad is given a task. Um, also, however, um, those of us who study and are interested in democracy uh, as a form of trust and rule have to confront the way in which um, uh, democratic representation is also a delegation or an agency relation. Okay, so in the book, I tried to develop a theoretical language for talking about this, which I'll just mention briefly, because I think what I want to talk about today really is the kinds of um, uh, figurations um, that, that manage uh, uh, that are used to put together hierarchical organizations. And I'm gonna talk about political modernity as an opening up of the space in which those configuration, those figurations are themselves contested. Um, so on my take on um, um, agency relations, uh, there, there are three power positions, rector, actor, and other. Um, they can be occupied by groups or individuals. Um, and an agency relation is created when a rector turns an actor into an agent um, and excludes other in various ways. Um, and in this, I drew directly on Julia Adams' work on the rule of fathers in patriarchal patrimonialism in the early modern world. And that is because I wanted to insist that every instantiation of uh, rector, actor, other relations, chains of power is a double instantiation of organizational relations, but also totemic or symbolic representations of who can give orders and who should follow them, who is allowed to have projects, who is within and without the political body. Um, so what this amounts to is saying that figuration in the sense of metaphor, imagery, narrative, and myth inflects the configuration of agency relations and the generation of new forms of agency in the modern world. Um, so if I could fast forward to our contemporary world, um, the importance of studying symbolic renderings of agency relations and not just agency relations as an organizational feature um, is demonstrated in a perhaps extreme way uh, by conspiracy theories. Most conspiracy theories are fantastical accounts of rectors, actors, and others. They tend to picture a situation where radically profane others are secretly the rectors of the universe, pulling the strings of various people who only seem to be the legitimate rectors of their society, but are, according to a given conspiracy account or theory, merely the agents of the true rulers. And I would point out that in contemporary American political culture, a version of this kind of rendering of the world um, has gone quite far and in fact has succeeded for large sections of the American population in reinterpreting a central category uh, of actor in the modern world. That is the civil servant um, has been uh, recoded by uh, uh, conspiracy theorists as the agent of the deep state. Okay, so um, back to the early modern and, 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 and uh, uh, the world in the 18th century. Um, so first in the book, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on this idea of the king's two bodies. And some of you have heard me drone on about this before. Uh, um, but, you know, my, my, my version of why, why the king is really that um, you know, what I discovered in, in Virginia and in Massachusetts in the 17th century is um, uh, uh, the, o the overwhelming usage of the language of the king and of the desire for communication with the king to conduct what we would recognize immediately as contentious politics. 
Um, so, so, and, and what I, I use the idea of the king's two bodies to talk about this because um, of the way in which this is a kind of figuration of a body that has a second body that contains the people. So uh, in and around Bacon's Rebellion, you see this over and over again when the governor says that the king's long hands are coming uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to punish um, uh, Nathaniel Bacon who is conducting an illegal war. Um, and what I took from this and theorize about the King's Two Bodies is, um, you know, that book, The King's Two Bodies is of course about ritual and it's sort of about political theology, but that book and, and, and my evidence at least suggests that talking about kingship or the King's body in this symbolic way um, is a pragmatic way to manage delegation. That is the idea, um, uh, 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 Nick, that can't be right <laughs> in terms of time. Um, so, uh, um, okay. Um, so I tried to talk about the King's Two Bodies as a way to manage delegation and hold together the empire in Virginia. And now what I'm gonna do is suggest that the language of the people, which we associate with democratic republicanism and also with populism emerge as a way to deal with how you seal together delegation and agency relations in hierarchy when the king's two, when the king's second body is absent. So when you tear down all the statues of, of King George III, what happens? Um, you have both a kind of gap in how you render state organizations sacred, and you also have, of course, a new problem which is how does one render the relationship between people and prince when one has fought a war to render uh, um, uh, uh, the people sovereign as our endless histories of uh, uh, the 18th century revolutions all, always have to, have to grapple with. So the question is how will trust and rule work? And um, now I'm gonna talk briefly about the thing that's over my left shoulder, which is the Christian millenarian answer to that question um, in the age of the early American Republic. Um, and my argument in the book is that um, is that we can see uh, in the picture over my left shoulder a direct answer um, by Christian millenarians um, in the early American Republic to Thomas Hobbes' question in the Leviathan: What holds the state together, and how can it be that all the little people are in the, the person of the sovereign? Um, and you can see the similarities, I think, uh, directly. So let me talk about um, Christian millenarianism in the early American Republic for a, section, for a second. In Herman Hussman's vision, for the Lord's will to be achieved on earth, the body of the people would have to become the measure of all things. Specifically, he proposed a scheme to assure that the delegation from the electorate to the rulers would be incorruptible. Small elections in townships would secure the body politic at the most basic level, because then each male Protestant farmer head of household would know personally those standing for election. Uh, um, and he would thus make the right choice based on his knowledge. In turn, those elected persons would elect people above them and above them and above them. Now, I wanna be clear that this is a kind of political theological fantasy and that's actually why I'm interested in it. If you followed Husband's schema that he put in his sermons, you know, directly, it would take over a hundred years to elect the first president of the United States. So um, what's interesting to me is the fantasy, not the Jeffersonian politics, which in a sense are very common. They're about currency, et cetera, right? What's interesting to me is that the fantasy here is um, f laser focused on this incredibly, you know, on, on a kind of, anxious problem for uh, uh, the discourse of the people in the early American Republic. And that problem is, how do you make sure that the delegation that goes from people to prince isn't corrupted? And his way of making sure of that is that everybody who is elected to a level of government has to serve on that level for 15 years or 10 years or five years so that the people who then elect them to the next level uh, know that man face to face. Um, so this is a political theology of the people's two bodies. Um, and I think it's now important to say that there's kind of a third body in husband's sermons. Um, his sermons 
uh, repeatedly discuss, um, I want to get the term exactly right here. Uh, um, the stinking carcass of filthy lucre whose avatar in lawyers and merchants and other rich and famous people will destroy the delegation from people to prince. Now, as we are all well aware, lawyers and merchants would not be the only mythically instantiated scapegoat in American political modernity. But this is kind of my theoretical point about kingship as a way of managing agency relations and its replacement. Isaac, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just want to give you a two minute warning. Perfect. That's exactly great. Um, uh, so what's the implications for this for how we think about modernity and maybe some things about the present, which I hope we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, we can think about modernity as, a, as the negative space opened up by the death of the second body of the king for the use of myth to secure agency relations. Now, many of our theories of modern organizations, um, including those offered by Michel Foucault and Pierre Bourdieu, do discuss the advent of modern state organizations as the death of the king. But they imagine what happens when you get rid of the king's household is some kind of triumph of the bureaucratic expert. I don't deny that there has been um, both a, a degree of functional differentiation and a triumph of certain formats of expertise about conduct in modern states. However, I do question whether the advent of those areas of rationalization has really come at the expense of enchanted myth. If there is a bumper sticker for this talk, it is, the only thing better for dominating a population than a bureaucracy is an enchanted bureaucracy. In fact, what I would suggest is that with the death of the king comes not a kind of disenchanted and imminent expertise of the modern state, but a vast proliferation of mythological signifiers that attempt to answer the question of who can be trusted with the business of the state and also the question of who can be trusted to be an agent of the people. In this regard, we can think of modern political figurations and metaphors about the body as an extended, extended contestation over these kinds of enchantments. Um, and I would suggest that um, everything from uh, international communism's insistence that the true body of the people uh, exists in the vanguard party to uh, um, the transatlantic pro, uh, project of race and racism uh, um, and white supremacy might be thought about in terms of enchanted signifiers that have come in to occupy the space left by the king. So the destruction of the king is not disenchantment, but rather an invitation for refigurations of the body politic. Insofar as this is true, it is reasonable then to conclude the following, the distribution of political agency in modern society is in part explained by how the mythological background for action has been refigured in the wake of the creative destruction of the two bodies of the king. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, very, uh, just fascinating presentation. And um, now we have, uh, we turn to Adam Slez for his presentation, which involves slides. We're good, it's just like a black screen for everybody. Yeah, okay. I'm unmuted, I think. Um, Okay. Oops. All right. Well, so thanks so much for having me and special thanks to the Flash Talk Committee for putting this together uh, and letting me share the stage with Isaac. Now, since this is supposed to be a Flash Talk, I'm just going to go, uh, go ahead and jump right in. So my talk today draws a material from my new book, The Making of the Populist Movement, which examines the origins of electoral populism in the United States in the late 19th century. 
focusing in particular on the emergence of third party activism in the American West in the period between 1890 and 1896. Now today I'm gonna to tell the story of how the turn to third party politics came to pass in South Dakota. And along the way, I'm gonna highlight three key ideas. First, populism can be defined independently of the ideological valence of the claims being made. Second, the emergence of electoral populism can only be understood in terms of the broader political environment or field in which action unfolds. And third, political identities are often rooted in the physical environment, which contributes to their stability over long periods of time. And so with these points in mind, what I wanna do now is set the historical stage and then we'll see how this all folds or how this all played out. So as I discuss in the book, we can trace the origins of the third party movement to here on South Dakota where a group of agrarian reformers known as the South Dakota Farmers Alliance voted to form a new party, the Independent Party, on June 6, 1890. Now, up until that point, the Alliance's primary focus was economic cooperation. Formed in 1885, the South Dakota Alliance, or the, sorry, the Dakota Alliance was at the forefront of the Western Alliance movement more generally, introducing programs related to cooperative purchasing, marketing, and insurance. And this all changed with the creation of the Independent Party, which ushered in a wave of third party activism throughout the agrarian periphery, culminating in the formation of a national level party known as the People's Party in 1891. Now, the following year, the new party managed to run independent candidate James B. Weaver for president. Um, and here we see Weaver and his running mate, James G. Field, uh, along with the text of their platform, which I understand you can't see. Uh, but the platform calls for, among other things, the nationalization of railroads and the free coinage of silver. And together, these are sort of the two major planks in the, in the populist program, uh, which in general was designed to remedy some of the economic hardship being faced by agrarian producers uh, in the country at the time. And so these planks are couched in the language of producerism. And producerism describes a world in which producing classes or plain people were pitted against non-producers such as railroad corporations and banks, okay, which is sort of the, kind of the two most well-known populist enemies here. And what I wanna point out here is that what makes this rhetoric populist is not its ideological valence, but the fact that it simultaneously valorizes the masses while vilifying the elites, okay? And so within theories that sort of try to understand populism as a form of political practice, it's this vertical distinction between masses and elites that really matters. Um, the thing that complicates it somewhat is that if we look at the populist press at the time, we see that these distinctions were often coupled with expressions of nationalism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. And so this creates a, a world in which we actually have sort of a right-wing cast to what would otherwise look like a left-wing uh, political program. Now, Weaver receives over a million votes as an independent candidate, um, but the new party quickly divides over the prospect of using electoral fusion or cross-endorsement to gain major party votes. If you're not familiar with the idea of fusion or cross-endorsement, uh, the basic idea is that a candidate would run on two tickets simultaneously. The reason why this feels unfamiliar today is in part because the populists were so successful with it that their enemies subsequently made it illegal. And that's why it only does not exist to the same extent today that it did in the 1890s. Um, and so it's the fusionist faction of the, populist, um, of the populist movement that ultimately wins out. Okay, and we can see this in the campaign poster here, which is for candidate William Jennings Bryant, who's nominated as both a populist and a Democrat in 1896. Okay, and at the top of the poster, you can see uh, reference to gold and silver coinage. Um, and the, the push for free silver in particular had become a rallying cry for the fusionist faction, which used the silver issue to attract support for members of both parties, uh, both major parties. And so if you know Brian's name prior to today, it's either because he was the lawyer in the Scubs Monkey Trials, so you may know him from Inherit the Wind, uh, or you know him because of his famous Cross of Gold speech in which he sort of went through sort of the, the evils of gold and promoting promoted free silver uh, and so on. And so in the end, Brian managed to, to secure nearly 47% of the popular vote running as both a populist and a Democrat. This is a huge increase over you know, populist candidate in 1892, but in a two-party contest, 47% is, you know, it's not great. So this was a, sort of a crushing defeat for the party. And so while the emergence of the party threatened to, to destroy the prevailing party system in this sort of brief moment between 1892 and 1896, the movement quickly collapses following Brian's defeat. Brian runs again as a populist in subsequent elections, but after 1896, the People's Party is no longer a viable entity for mass mobilization. Okay, so this gives us a lot to talk about. 
But what I want to focus on today is a single question, namely, how did we get to June 6th, 1890, the moment at which the populist movement decides to enter the political arena? And I'm going to approach this question from a field theoretic perspective. My general uh, claim going forward is that the emergence of electoral populism can be understood as an attempt to get fresh action in Harrison White's terms in a field in which the configuration of elite interests was literally locked in place. Um, in the book, I argue that the potential for political ossification was a direct result of the settlement process, which allowed local elites to dictate the rules of the political game, making it difficult for outsiders or otherwise marginal competitors to get ahead in subsequent rounds of play. So what I wanna do with the remaining time today is briefly sketch out the broad argument developed in the book and then focus on the competitive dynamics that led up to June 6th. And then by way of conclusion, I'll briefly revisit the three, the three theoretical lessons from which we started. Okay. So the big argument of the book breaks into two pieces, which roughly speaking, we can think about a settlement on the one hand and then it's populist discontents on the other. Uh, and when I talk about the settlement process, what I really mean here is the expansion of state and market. This should you know, give you uh, memories of the Vendee and how Tilly talks about urbanization. Um, in the US case, the expansion of the state was made possible by the acquisition of public land and the forced relocation of indigenous tribes who are effectively organized out of the polity through the creation of the reservation system. In contrast, white settlers are organized into the polity through the creation of territories and states following procedures that were first laid out as part of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. The push for political organization was driven by collective action on the part of local elites who hoped to generate resources in the form of political offices and public institutions. In other words, they, they could continually redivide public land as a way of generating vacancies out of nowhere. So they would get new political offices, new capitals, new public institutions, right? So you could create something out of nothing. And so from this perspective, the existence of states such as South Dakota are not so much neutral cases as they are outcomes of the process that I'm trying to describe and understand. Now, in this context, the expansion of centralized authority and the organization of political space went hand in hand with the spread of market infrastructure, such as rail lines and grain elevators. Oops, not there yet. Um, and so to the extent that railroad corporations actively manipulated terms of trade to maximize profit, the construction of a national market came at the expense of agrarian producers who were effectively shut out of a system dominated by market intermediaries. And so this is where agrarian populism comes in. In many respects, the second half of the book is a story of roads not taken, right? Cooperative populism through the Farmers Alliance wasn't enough in the absence of concerted intervention on the part of the state. Similarly, the prospect of regulatory populism was in the air, but the potential for meaningful regulation was undermined by legal ambiguity that wouldn't be resolved until after the turn of the century. And so the only way forward was to form a new party. Okay, and so, and so this is where I'm going to focus uh, the time today. And so in the end, the turn to third party activism in South Dakota was directly linked to the process of field formation following the transition to statehood. To make sense of how this all played out, we need to understand how territorial politics actually worked. Um, to the extent that territorial politics was about securing resources for nascent communities, political divides tended to be organized geographically. And so unless there was a major national level um, issue that sort of intervened, the default sort of status for territorial politics was hyper-localism. And so the earliest divides, even before the Dakota Territory is formed, are between Yankton, Sioux Falls, and Pembina, which we can see on the map here. Yankton and Sioux Falls are in what would become South Dakota. Pembina is in what would become North Dakota. And so each of these um, towns or communities is run by its own network of local elites. These are basically separate development projects, some of which are backed by political parties, other of which are backed by large corporations. Um, in the end, Yankton becomes the territorial capital, and this makes it the center of political power in the territory. And this creates a situation for a brief period in which political divides among the Yankton elite were for all intents and purposes synonymous with political divides in the territory more generally. This doesn't last forever. Um, what happens is that, you know, beginning in the 1870s, the arrival of the Northern Pacific Railroad threatens to upset the balance of power by creating a rival faction in the town of Bismarck, okay, which is located in Northern Dakota. Okay, and so the divide between Yankton and Bismarck is reinforced by the rules governing territorial politics. 
Generally speaking, territorial politics tended to be a one party affair. This was true in the Dakota Territory, but elsewhere, usually the territory went with whatever party admitted it into, uh, admitted it as a territory. And so the, this left local elites to sort themselves into rival factions based on whether they allied with the territorial governor or the territorial representative who then vied for control over the distribution of political patronage. Whereas the governor was a federal appointee, the territorial representative was elected by the residents of the territory. And so this creates a situation in which fights over political patronage could be naturally expressed in terms of a divide between insiders versus outsiders. And this style of, of politicking and the style of fighting reaches its peak in the early 1880s following the arrival of territorial governor Nehemiah Ordway. Um, Ordway initially tried to build ties with um, party leaders such as Richard Pettigrew. These efforts fail. And so what ends up happening is that to get ahead, Ordway allies with the rising Bismarck faction, uh, which was backed by the Northern Pacific Railroad, along with a cadre of sympathetic newspaper editors. Okay, and so this has all the makings of sort of Western political machine. Um, and working in conjunction with Ordway, the Bismarck fac faction succeeds in stealing the territorial capital from Yankton in 1883. They literally take a train and move it very, very slowly through the town of Yankton. And by the time they are done, they're able to like legally take um, take the capital. And so that's like its own story. Um, but this is also part of a broader pattern of corruption that ultimately gets Ordway thrown out of office. Okay, and just to think about this, to get thrown out of office for corruption in the late 19th century is like a real achievement. Okay, so Ordway is genuinely, genuinely terrible by all sort of like measures. Um, okay, and so when Ordway leaves, this doesn't actually resolve the, the problem. Okay, in the sense that what the Ordway debacle does is it solidifies the movement to have South Dakota admitted as a separate state, giving rise to Hugh Campbell's We Are a State Doctrine, which provided a philosophical justification for extra legal organization in advance of congressional legislation. So what you have is Southern Dakotans proactively writing constitutions and electing people to offices that don't exist, effectively performing as if the state were there. And so I hope that this would, we can open this up for conversation later because this part really feels very similar to the types of things that Isaac uh, likes to talk about. Um, now, the movement for division and statehood benefited from the emergence of the Farmers Alliance under Henry Laux, okay, who we see here. Um, Laux eventually serves as president of both the Northern and Southern Alliance uh, organizations, and so he's one of the most decorated alliance leaders at this time. Um, now, one thing I want to point out here is that while Laux is the head of the populist movement, he's not really the hard scrabble farmer that the movement said to represent. Um, Laux is in many ways a frontier entrepreneur. Um, he doesn't end up necessarily being rich. Pettigrew ends up being very, very rich. Pettigrew came to the territory as a, as a poor law student who was working doing land surveys and basically started speculating in land. Laux also shows up. Laux ends up being a large landowner. Um, and he's a newspaper editor. He's a reformed newspaper editor, which was a natural stepping stone into politics. Okay, And by most accounts, he was actually pretty bad at farming. So, I do want to highlight that he is not necessarily the same type of person that he is said to represent as a leader of the movement. Okay, and so he is, uh, you know, a potential political rival here. Um, and so the territorial faction in the alliance movement could find common cause in their opposition to the growing dominance of Bismarck, okay, the town of Bismarck and the Bismarck faction and the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, but the push to admit South Dakota as a separate state was ultimately a move to solidify the position of Republican bosses such as Pettigrew, who headed up a group of elites commonly referred to as the Combine. And so this includes both Pettigrew, who's from Sioux Falls, existing members of the former Yankton oligarchy, and as well as sort of more radical folks like Hugh Campbell. Okay, and the key point that we want to keep in our mind for thinking about what's happening is that by dividing the territory in two, Republican elites in Southern Dakota succeeded in redefining the boundaries of the political field thereby eliminating their chief rival, okay, the chief rivals in Bismarck, okay? And what they're left with is they're still left with the Farmers Alliance. And at this point, the Alliance actually controls a large and somewhat inconsistent block of votes in the territorial legislature. And so this gives them hope that they might share power within the confines of the existing one-party system. But this never comes to pass. The tipping point um, in the lead up to the formation of the Independent Party on June 6, 1890, was the fight over the distribution of Senate seats both of which went to members of the moderate wing of the Republican elite, including Pettigrew. And so sensing that the game was rigged in favor of the moderates, Laux and the Alliance turned to third, third party politics as a means of getting ahead. And over time, they're actually, they're joined by elite defectors such as Hugh Campbell, who is similarly locked out. 
Campbell does come up as part of the Republican elite, but it's clear that he's not getting a good job either. And so he quickly goes populist. Okay, and over time, by the time we get to 1896, Pettigrew actually goes on to join the populists. Okay, and this is sort of an entirely different story. I do, do want to highlight very briefly that late in his life, uh, Pettigrew is actually sending copies of his book to folks like Trotsky and Lenin. So this is a legitimate conversion experience in which his star within the Republican Party increasingly declines as he becomes increasingly radical and then joins forces with the, the populists and loudists and so on. Okay. And so with the remaining time, I just want to sort of briefly revisit the theoretical, sort of three theoretical lessons that I laid out at the beginning. Uh, the first lesson is that populism is a form of political practice that exists independently of the ideological valence of the claims being made. This is a long way of saying that populism can be directed toward any number of ends. And so the push to understand populism as a repertoire or form of political practice, as opposed to a thing, has been driven by the problem of trying to make sense of the coexistence of both left and right wing populism. Um, we see this in a number of places. Uh, I think foremost, I'd point to the oscillation between left and right wing populism in Latin America over the last century. Okay, but closer to home, we could also point to the election of 2016, right? Trump and Sanders are both labeled as populists, but we would never confuse the one with the other. Um, and my opinion you know, here is that we tend to get tripped up when our understanding of populism begins to depend on essentialist assertions about what a given instantiation of populism is really about. Um, I can think of contemporary examples of this, but I would also sort of sticking to my own area of expertise, I would just say, let's think about what happened in the case of 19th century populism, where historians went back and forth on whether the populist movement was a rational forerunner to the progressive and New Deal era politics, or a form of proto-fascism anticipating McCarthy, uh, you know, sort of born out of cultural anxiety. And, and this, this oscillation is coming from the sense that it, as if it had to be one thing or the other. And what I want to say is it doesn't. It does not have to be one thing or the other. And so the way to make sense of the emergence of populist sentiment is to look at the characteristics of the political field to understand when it is strategically useful for elites to engage in populist claim making. Okay, and this gets to the, the sort of second lesson here, which is that electoral populism can only be understood in terms of the configuration of elites within the political field. This follows from a more general argument in the book about mass politics, where I suggest that we can think about the political field as a form of Whiteian production market in which political identities emerge as a byproduct of elite competition. Okay, another way of thinking about this is mass identities are not given so much as they are actively made by political elites competing with one another. Um, and I'd highlight the parties have an obviously, uh, parties obviously have a role to play here. Okay, but the only way to make sense of the turn to third party politics in places like South Dakota during the 19th century is by looking at the competitive relationship between elites within the Republican Party. Uh, and the central point, you know, and sort of drawing on work uh, Bart Bonikowski, is that the strategic appeal of populist claim making is a function of one's position vis a vis their competitors. Okay, and so this is not immediately reducible to questions of parties or party membership. Parties are a means to an end in a field where elite competition is based on mass mobilization, but neither parties nor mass mobilization can be taken for granted, particularly when considering historical cases. Okay, and so in this respect, I think the competitive relationships deserve pride of place when it comes to explaining changes and patterns of mass mobilization. The third and final lesson that I wanna leave us with here um, is that to the extent that political identities are rooted in physical space, patterns of contention are often slow to change, creating the sense that politics is, in Paul Pearson's words, big, slow moving and invisible. And I would go a step further and say, it's not just that it creates a sense that it's big, slow moving, and invisible, it's that elites actively work to make politics big, slow moving and invisible because that's how they get ahead, is by dictating the rules of the game so that they can play and then play that game out. Okay, and the expansion of the state and market in the American West is one big example of this. Um, but we can also look to the American South during the same period. Uh, the arrival of the railroad has a similar effect on political identities, but it's complicated by the fact that these fights and that these fights were intertwined with the, the racialized politics of the post reconstruction era. And so for this reason, I would never put Western, the electoral phase of Western populism and Southern populism side by side because it's a very different um, sort of political background that they're, they're playing against. Uh, for more recent examples, we can point to the expansion of the federal highway system. As Clayton Knoll shows, the construction of the federal highway is direct, has directly contributed to contemporary patterns of political polarization. Um, and because these underlying changes are rooted in the transformation of the physical environment, 
they're unlikely to change anytime soon. And so just to sort of wrap this up uh, on this point, I was saying, let's just think about the, the rural urban divide, right? Looking back at the 19th century, it's not that farmers are collectively freaked out by urban society. It's that they were a party to an ongoing fight over the process of urbanization, which involved directing resources to some locations and not others. This contributed to the creation of robust political identities that continue to thrive today, with the important caveat that these divides have been iteratively reinforced by various policy projects that have been undertaken since the 19th century. Okay, and so I think this is a good place to leave things for the purpose of discussion. I've tried to put a lot on the table. I've also left a lot out on both a historical and theoretical front. Uh, so I look forward to um, discussing this with you and hearing your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adam, for the wonderful presentation. Now to help us uh, digest those two courses, we are going to turn to um, Iowana Sendru, who is a postdoctoral associate fellow at Harvard University. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the talks. I mean, doing this was daunting, as I'm sure you can all appreciate now. Um, because these are both tremendous academic projects. Um, and so what I thought, what I tried to do basically was to read each book through the prism of the other. And that's how, you know, to get us started. Um, frankly, what I probably ended up doing is injecting my own biases to everything I'm saying and then attributing them to either Adam or Isaac. Um, so in as much as you want to engage Adam and Isaac, uh, even though half the comments are to one and then half to the other, please point out if I'm wrong on anything uh, that I'm about to say. Um, so what I thought I'd do regarding Isaac's book was to effectively attach a new empirical case, populism, to his model of power relations, uh, which th that triad of um, actor, rector, and other. So. Um, two questions. The first comes out of Adam's deeply evocative field-based argument that populism was a matter of the transformation of physical space as the American state expanded and developed westward. And um, for me, it, it brings up a question that I've had, um, chicken egg basically for actor rector, right? Um, and the simplest way out of it is to say that they define themselves through their relationship. Um, but then isn't that in a way a matter of fields? So effectively a field uh, perhaps implying a new situation whereby uh, an actor-rector relationship can be elaborated or constructed. So really what's happening is new place or new time um, through which uh, that can you know, performatively create uh, this new actor-rector pair. And I think that actually echoes some of Adam's thinking on populism as an attempt to get fresh action into an ossified static field. Um, and then my second and related question surrounds who counts as actor versus other. So for Adam, populism is driven by marginalized elites who, and this is also building on some of Bart Bonikowski's work, um, they have nothing to lose by trying to explode everything, right? By questioning the legitimacy of the whole political game. Um, but I wonder, are these populists other or are they actors? And I think both might be interesting possibilities. Um, so if they're other, then you might say, Isaac, that they're both other and a competing rector with their own state building project. But maybe there's space here for thinking through almost the accrual of competing rectorhood in as much as the populist project sort of gains ground and starts accomplishing things. Um, so thinking through, alterity as a space for gaining power rather than, than either having it or not having it. So using the language from your book of, you know, not scapegoat versus slave, but a slave sort of becoming a scapegoat, if that makes sense. Um, and then the other alternative, which I actually think is more interesting and maybe possibly closer related empirically to what Adam is describing, is that the populists as less powerful, somehow marginalized members of the state building project that they're sort of contesting are actors and not really other. But if they're actor, then what they're doing is not contesting the rector's authorship of the state building project, I don't think, but they're literally just thumbing their noses at it, 
right? Um, which seems somehow different or peculiar. Most revolutionaries, for instance, I think they took the king very seriously, right? So it's slightly different. Um, so how can we theorize this populist ethos of wanting to blow everything up, right? Where does it fit with how agency relations are contested? Um, okay, so then to Adam. So Adam, as you just saw, thinks about the American West in terms of both territorial and political expansion, such that changes in the physical environment change politics and shape the rise of electoral populism in the late 19th century. So it's this really elegant idea of fielded populism that's also deeply convincing. And I absolutely agree that if we want to be in any way effective in defining populism, it needs to be about field position with ideology or policy ideas sort of embroidered on top of that in a context specific way. That's why Bernie Sanders is a populist and so is the other guy he, who shall not be named. So uh, I buy that. But then I think, you know, as a set of power relations emerging and shifting through the building of boundaries, what's implied maybe to build off Isaac is not only mastery of space, but of time, right? So a rector or a would-be rector projects a certain idea of the future, and that's how power gets elaborated. But then temporality to me, especially through imaginaries of the future, is not only a, a dimension of power relations, but indeed at the same time sort of a peculiar but also important sort of ideology maybe. Um, I think that's the case for the American dream, which is certainly implicated in today's right-wing populism. Arlie Hochschild is great on making that point. Uh, but that's even the case for the idea of the frontier, um, which allows for the vertiginous sort of creation of boundaries that you describe. And the frontier as a trope was almost always about this open, forever mutable boundary and probably became explicitly temporal once you couldn't go any further west or south, right? So it became about technological advances, landing on the moon, freedom and democracy in the world, or, you know, many other fairly imperial expansions. So what I'm trying to say is that populism is surely about contesting a whole power system because you feel or exist outside of it, right? It's the virtuous people against the evil elite. But doesn't that mean that it's also about elaborating an alternative idea of space and time, right? As Isaac puts it, you need models of the world and models for the world. And more broadly, perhaps the idea the, sorry, the ability to make, to create populist ideas, to make populist claims is performative. It's a cultural process that becomes meaningful in time. And so it changes shape as meanings change, again, borrowing from Isaac. So rather than being able to look at a snapshot of a field's power distribution and tell you populist or not across a particular confidence interval, maybe there's also something of a performativity to power distributions and to boundaries that get built up in some communities heads rather than being self-evident from the start. Um, and the way you talk about boundaries, Adam, is an example, um, that they're not obvious, but rather that they're mutable. And so they do a lot of political work or your discussion of Republican elites just now. Um, or this could be especially important in terms of who gets to credibly wield populist rhetoric, right? Which Adam convincingly argues, for those of you who haven't read the book, that it's a matter of a disgruntled elite being perceived as structurally analogous to would-be constituents within a particular political field. But maybe there's also the need for a political performance, basically convincing constituents, showing that you're analogous in as much as proving analogousness is a thing. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm really just asking variations of the same question in terms of projected futures, I guess, or performativity, which are really about the project being elaborated by this populist would-be rector as they're laying claim to a particular field position or definition. And I think there are limits absolutely to our ability to conceptualize and operationalize that in a way that's meaningful and consistent, right? Without essentializing as, as you were just saying. Um, but I'm just super curious to get your thoughts on how these might fit, if at all. So yeah, really, that's all I had to say. I don't want to go any longer since I'm sure you all have lots of questions. And frankly, we I'm sure we all would rather just hear Adam and Isaac speak. But um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to read and to respond.
Thank you so much, uh, Ioana, for getting us started. Um, so as we transition here to the question and answer period, I think probably uh, the best way to start is maybe ask Isaac and Adam to uh, reflect a little bit on those wonderful comments. And in the meantime, um, if you aren't comfortable asking your question verbally, feel free to type it in the public chat um, or just uh, throw your little blue Zoom hand up. So um, how about we go in reverse order of presentation? So Adam, uh, would you like to start with some reflections? And then we'll go to Isaac. Yeah, so thanks so much for those questions. Um, you know, these are things I've been thinking about for a while. As folks may realize, Isaac and I are in the same department. We've also known each other since the Queen Mary SSHA years ago. And so we've been talking about these ideas for a very, very long time. And we have different ways of delivering them, but I've always viewed them as being two sides of the same coin. Um, and so it, you know, I, it makes sense to me that we can talk back and forth to one another. And so I just want to sort of speak to what would it be if I were to tell the story like I were Isaac and I were a uh, cultural sociologist who were good, who's good at talking about hermeneutics and interpretation and all those things that Isaac does that I don't. But what I want to sort of say, so this, this idea of time and space, um, this comes up in a number of ways that are really, really interesting because interpretations of the populace are often ones where we imagine they are backward looking because they are opposing the, the growth of industrial capitalism. But it come, the sense of this being backwards is because we believe that they're holding on to this yeoman myth, right? And this is, this is from Hofstetter. And so we typically treat them as backward looking in time. This is one where I'll point to um, Charles Postel's work where he says, this is absolutely not the case. The, the, what populists are doing is they're trying to come up with modern solutions to contemporary problems, to, you know, to the changes that, that bring us into modernity, namely capitalism and the expansion of the state. And so their solutions are not backwards. They're also very much entrepreneurial, particularly in the West. These are not sort of subsistence farmers who have the market imposed by them. These are entrepreneurs who are actively working to construct the market, construct cities, but some of them lose in terms of getting resources concentrated in their own place. And so the vision that they are projecting into the future um, and this will also highlight their distinctions. They are basically, they are, yes, it's left wing, but it's not socialism. They are very much there for the market, but what they are pushing is what they would refer to as a freer market by doing things like nationalizing transportation infrastructure. And so they're absolutely a party to this. They are absolutely sort of preceding what we might think of as modern solutions. So that's one way in which sort of time and space matter, and they are projecting in a sense, an alternative capitalism, right? We could think about they, they, this goes with sort of like Mark Schneiberg's work on cooperatives as sort of this alternative niche to the growth of large scale industrial capitalism. They are performing this by creating their own companies. Um, the other place where we see this type of performance is not so much from the populace themselves, but from the regulators. And so there's a chapter in the book that I didn't talk about, about regulatory innovation. And it is clear at this point that entities like the railroad can be regulated, but it's not clear who can do it. And so you have all of these progressive state level bodies that want to do things like regulating freight rates, but the Supreme Court says this isn't going to be up to the state, it's going to be the Interstate Commerce Commission, but the Interstate Commerce Commission can't do anything. And so when you look at the records of these regulators, what they do is they, they act like they can regulate. And they, they do these things when in reality, it's basically noblesse oblige on the part of uh, the railroad corporations who are tired of dealing with, you know, these, these little, little regulators who don't have any power, but they have to project power in these annual reports where they say, we got the companies to do this. And so a lot of this is basically failed performance due to the lack of legal infrastructure to actually give, produce power there. And so, um, one of the ways, and that's all to sort of think about, you know, performance more generally is a lot of what Isaac and I are talking about is uncertain situations where people use performance to try to resolve ambiguity. You know, you're trying to perform your way out of ambiguity or a lack of relational clarity. And so here I would sort of, you know, like I've signaled Harrison White a number of times, which is like a Rorschach test. We could mean that any way we want, but I'm thinking, you know, Eric Leifer's work where so much of the work, so many of the things we talk about are stratification and unequals, but so much of our life is of our life is about interacting with peers. And we have these moments where someone wants to make a step ahead. And the question is, how is that going to be done? And how is it going to be publicly legitimated? And that's where these types of performative and interpretive acts are deeply important as you have people in these ambiguous situations. But in the absence of performance, there's no clear way of sort of signaling and securing a, a legitimated inequality. So I'll just leave it at that and turn it over to Isaac. 
Thanks, Adam. And those comments, um, I mean, I want to affirm, I mean, I think that the idea that um, what performance does, and I would say maybe performance, performative power in particular, in the sense of being able to bind um, inferiors uh, into certain projects is indeed, you know, it, it definitely, I, I think it comes to the fore in uncertain situations where binding is required for accomplishing a project, but um, the kind of uh, um, uh, usual accoutrements of uh, um, uh, organization and maybe even ha habits um, are, are, are not doing the trick. Um, you know, I, I the, you know, the first thing I want to say is that like, you know, this is, you know, there's definitely an aspect where uh, both of these projects are, I mean, there are all these sort of similarities, even though that they're, they're um, divided by a hundred years. I mean, Williams Jennings Bryan in particular, the cross of gold speech um, can easily be lined up with Herman Husband's sermons. Um, in fact, it's eerie how much the politics of Bryan um, match the politics of the um, of uh, the early Jeffersonians, particularly the um, uh, the, the the adamantly Christian ones. Um, so, husband Herman Husband, who I talked about, I mean, his currency politics are sort of the 18th century version of, of William Jennings Bryan. So, there's a kind of iterative question here about um, uh, the language of the people and the language of populism um, in a long arc of, of um, American history. I, I think the way I would answer some of Juana's questions. It's just to say that, you know, my, I guess my take on sort of like the particular story of the 1790s um, in the early American Republic is that it is a kind of, before it is reasonable to claim that there is a full, a functioning political field that would constitute elite struggle and elite interests in the way that Adam is describing. And we could actually, I think I would like, what I would like to come out of this is actually a set of questions about, um, you know, the scope of um, the particular kinds of elite struggle that Adam is describing. I think that probably its explanatory scope, you know, is like a, itself a kind of, um, modeled picture in terms of American history and American politics. And it would be very interesting to know sort of when it is that the field construct can give us an explanation like Adams and when we kind of have to reach a little bit outside it. Um, and, and what I would say about this is, 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 I think we're studying, I agree it's two sides of the same coin because I see my study, right? So I guess what I would say is to get to the point where you have politics in the way that Adam is describing it where elites mobilize votes to struggle against other elites. And that does a great deal of explaining how and when they position themselves as, as populists. I guess to get to that point, a lot of things have to be eliminated. Um, and including that, what I would include is things like the Whiskey Rebellion, where, where um, there, it's apparently a possibility in the Whiskey Rebellion that if you don't want to pay your whiskey taxes, what you do is tar and feather people and burn barns down um, and march a, a rebel army through Pittsburgh. Um, and under those conditions, there sort of isn't a field yet. Um, and so I think there's a kind of interesting and difficult question here. And I would say that, you know, the way that, I guess what I would say is that that, you know, I think my, my question is complementary to Adams, but I mean, I guess what I would say is, I think that under the history of electoral struggle in populist language is like another subterranean history, which is physical violence and its, uh, and its symbolization, right? And, and so my story in the book, which combines the Whiskey Rebellion with the, the Battle of Fallen Timbers and the, um, uh, uh, the 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 radical and violent exclusion of the Miami tribe from anything like a patronage relationship, um, and I guess what I would say is like you know a kind of history of populism might try to look at how those two things articulate with each other, because I think to have electoral populism means also that you know um, you know one might exclude or include in complicated ways different violent practices, and so so I I don't know the answer to that question, but. Iwana's discussion really raises this as an issue.
how do we want to think about articulation, political articulation vis-a-vis -vis what I basically view as mythologically instantiated um, uh, 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 agency relations that are related to the violent arm of the state? Right. Um, and, and, and so and so I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that the, the counterpoint between me and Adam sort of articulates uh, ar articulates that question as one for the for research in the future. Great. So uh, with that said, um, we can throw it open to a general question. So again, please feel free to type in the text thread or uh, in the chat thread or throw your blue hands up. Anne Orloff. Yes, so thanks for these really interesting talks which had me thinking a lot about contemporary politics, obviously. Not, I guess maybe it's not obvious that we always take it to the contemporary, but actually my question has more to do with the theoretical apparatus that we use. And I'm quite persuaded by the culturalist account. But one of the things I wanted to hear maybe a little bit more about is where you would put kind of psychodynamic factors, you know, kind of investments in that sense. I, I thought about this particularly with Isaac's discussion about um, enchantment, although it also comes up in Adam's discussion of why certain people can be representative of groups and others can't. But are these accounts at odds with something that would take psychodynamics seriously? Or, you know, how does, how does one think about simultaneously psychic investment and cultural uh, repertoires and such. Thanks. Um, Nick, should I just start or you want to collect questions? Okay. Um, so I view, I mean, I, I view the kind of account that I'm trying to give um, as compatible with um, uh, an exploration of um, that kind of, let's say, political psychology of in, in, investment. Um, I'm very interested in which signs and for which reasons um, uh, people are cathecting, let's say. Um, uh, but what, and so what I would say is that the, the, the theoretical apparatus is actually designed to allow that, but I don't go very deeply into it in the book. Um, it's something I'm interested in exploring further. Um, you know, I think one way that I would put it vis-a-vis -vis Adam's work is that he's very he has a very nice explanation of why populist politicians are convincing because they are offering themselves as a sort of structural homology vis-a-vis -vis the field of political elites as is imagined to be their electorate, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the society or the market or, I mean, right, so that, and, and I, I would I would propose, however, that, that the degree to which that is convincing may depend on the degree to which other kinds of investments are or are not convincing to voters. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, so, so my story is actually partially a story um, about certain investments which are very convincing to certain voters in 1794, but not um, in 1801, by which point they are in the the what the, the white frontier farmers in Western Pennsylvania are in um, Thomas Jefferson's party, and you can get a kind of uh, um, Adam Sles story pretty quickly for the era, you know, sort of 1801 to 1820. And, and I, I guess what I would say is that that involves, um, let's say, a correlation. Uh, sorry, uh, a corralling of psychic investment. Um, whereas, you know, at least in my investigations. Part of what I'm interested in is just that there are more psychic investments, as you would put it, in, um, than are usually offered in our uh, theories in political sociology. That once you dive into into these questions, you end up, um, you know, realizing right. And so I guess I guess in a certain sense, what I'm trying to suggest by rector, actor, other, and the variable investment in totemic representations of leaders is um, I think from my perspective, like from 
QAnon is not surprising at all as a political religious movement. <laughs> Right. Um, that in fact, that in fact, this is actually quite recognizable. It has, of course, a modern form that has to do with the internet, et cetera, and do your own research, et cetera. But this is actually quite recognizable uh, um, um, rendering of um, uh, political psychology in terms of the relationship to leaders, and in particular, in terms of the conceptualization of the state. I can show you reams of sermons. Um, in which the existing American government is described as the Eastern snake of wealthy financiers. So if you think, you know, right. Um, um, now, now actually interesting, interestingly in Herman Husband, this is actually, this is not articulated by anti-Semitism, right? Uh, 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 um, and, so, and so that's later. But, but my point is that the, this recurrent representation is, you know, is related to your, to your question. Adam. Yeah, so I want to, um, you know, so I don't know that I have a definitive response, but I do want to sort of sp spell out something that I was alluding to in the theoretical points at the end. I feel like sociology has an uncomfortable relationship with psychological explanations, and it comes up in a very clear way in debates since 2016. And I'll just sort of highlight, you know, there were, uh, you know, was, you know, there was an exchange with Steve Morgan, a political soci political scientist, about whether 2016 is really about economics or whether it's really about sort of like anxiety over you know status and race and culture and what it, this immediately reminded me is like well but this is the same fight that political sociologists and historical sociologists had in the 60s where we're trying to get rid of classical movement theory where notions of psychology were used as a way of delegitimating right and so the thing is that we selectively applied either eco, eco, rational we, we basically contrasted rational economic with psychological cultural as a way of saying how we felt about the movement we were studying rather than applying these things in meaningful ways. And so I think like psychic attachments are hugely important. And the, the thing that I've had in my mind, but, but we feel uncomfortable with them because there are movements that I feel comfortable saying we collectively don't like. And so we don't want to acknowledge those psychic attachments. But think about behavioral economics. We know if we give someone a coffee cup, we're gonna have to give them a lot of money to get it back because we have attachments to these things. And so we understand this for basic goods, but then don't want to acknowledge it for like, large scale effective attachments over time and history. And so I, I so I don't know what the answer is other than to say that I feel uncomfortable with the way in which we selectively use psychology as a way of either sele selectively resort to different types of grievances as a way of saying whether we like or don't like something. I tried to step away from this by saying, I don't, to me, it is, it is it's up to the populace how they feel about these things. But I wanted to sort of make sense of how they made strategic choices without having to make a judgment about whether I thought these things were really economic or really cultural and whether one was, you know, like, or you see, you know, I think Danny Roderick had a thing in the New York Times where he referred to good populism, right? And so, like, as our ex explanation of the phenomenon depends on our judgment, and we've coupled notions of good and bad with notions of economic rationality, which we can usually get behind, okay, and then use selectively use culture. Um, so it's not an answer, it's more that I think I share the question of how we use psychology and feel uncomfortable with the way in which sociology has, has or has not internalized it. Wonderful, uh, thank you, Adam. Um, so we had a text question uh, come in from Atef who asks that I read it because he's got a sore throat. Um, so I'll, set, I'll just read it here. Thanks to Isaac, Adam, and Ilana. Few a quest, uh, few questions. Number one, Adam, if we borrow Isaac's theory, where are others in your analysis? To Isaac, um, despite the fact that you started the talk with discussing revolutionary entanglements, England, the US, and Haiti, the, anal the analysis still feels US-based. Can you elaborate on how the notion of the other exists on different scales, the local, local, global, and so forth? Now to both of you, number three, we often talk in political or historical sociology classes about the moment of inverting the sovereignty of the people, second king's body in Isaac's terms, and then the talk of people in populist politics, Adam, and this is Adam's work. Theoretically and analytically, we often confuse the two, people's sovereignty and popular sovereignty and or populist politics. Any advice? Um, 
I guess keeping the same order and um, so let's see. I want to. What do I want to talk about here? Um, so right. So in the book, I do. Um, so I, I do have a chapter on the on on killing the king in the French Revolution, and um, I mean, and in that chapter, I I uh, um, I write a little bit about um, uh, the politics of uh, uh, Citizen Belly uh, talk addressing the National Convention. Um, I I don't I didn't have the crayle, so I couldn't um, do a comparative <laughs> study of Haiti, but I think it's actually absolutely essential. And the way I would characterize. Um, my kind of overarching argument about this is that, um, and I want to do this carefully. So when the second body of the king is eliminated in modernity, if we think of it as, as this negative space into, into which many things can rush. And my argument is that the, is that the, the, the creative destruction of the king's two bodies is one episode in the long arc of the Black Atlantic with some interesting uh, uh, um, um, consequences. But one of the things that happens when um, the people is manifested as a signifier, because in my understanding of politics, um, such signifiers are always attached to the question of agency relations that the world of the people that replaces the world of the king is a, is a world in which there is intense, intense uh, attention to struggle over and violent policing of the edge of the body of the people. Um, now, I don't want to deny that the 17th and 18th centuries in the North American continent um, involved um, a lot of war and you know, I, I'm sure that the Hobbesians in Virginia that I read were correct that uh, uh, um, uh, you know life was nasty, brutish, and short on the frontier. However, I would point out, and this is something I talk try to talk about in a variety of ways in the book in my hermeneutics. I mean, I would point out that the that the early modern world of the king's two bodies or the emperor's two bodies is as the Spanish cognate or. Um, uh, the circle of great uncles, which is the um, Iroquois cognate to the king's two bodies in the Iroquois empire, that world of the early modern um, does, at least in my study, have a certain flexibility at the edge for turning others into actors. Um, and vice, and, 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 and in a reverse way, actors into others. It has a pragmatism to it precisely because the king is absent and, 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 um, and, and, and no one in the field of battle or treaty negotiation is pretending that they in fact are the avatar of, of God on earth. There's a long line. Um, in contrast, Anthony Wayne, the general of the new US army who burns everything after the battle Battle of Fallen Timbers thinks that he is the apotheosis of the American people and he doesn't have to, he writes the treaty and not George Washington. So what I want to say about this is that there are certain kinds of alterity and um, hyperviolent othering that are afforded by the world after the king's two bodies. And we can see this, of course, in the French response to the Haitian Revolution and into, to Haitian independence. We can see this in the intensification of um, uh, um, uh, racial oppression and slavery, you know, by between, like, say, 1789 and 1830 in the American South. Um, and but we could also see this, I mean, the, the kind of takeover of the of racial coding in the point, you know, in the moment in the Haitian constitution when, 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 um, you know, it's announced that all Haitians are black, right? So, so, I mean, I think, I think what I would say is that there's a kind of politics of the rat radically profaned other that is one of the features of the world that enters when the world of the king is destroyed. Um, and therefore, when we think about the people being brought in as sovereign, as in your third question, we have to think simultaneously about the symbolic economy of who is in and out of the people. And in, in the American case, this occurs via this in, intense, 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 intense um, anxiety and intensification of racialization in the early American Republic and then all the way to the lead up and of course after the Civil War, which is, which is, which is about now that we have all of these rectors in the society, you know, 
how do we how do we protect that body right so so that 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 would be like that my my attempt to, my attempt to answer a very interesting and 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 and, and uh, a question that I definitely didn't address in my talk. Floor is yours, Adam. Okay, so the to answer the first thing about where is are the others? You know, who are the? I guess this sounds like I'm talking about lost now, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, and so if we think about others and sort of who are the alters in this project, I mean, I think the clear example in this case would be to think about sort of the indigenous populations in the United States. If the project that is unfolding is one of constructing and expanding the American state, to be part of this project, either as rector or actor, involves recognition that you are a party to the state. But what's happening with both forced removal and the creation of the reservation system is that indigenous populations are being organized out. Okay, they are not given the right to vote. They are not treated as citizens. Uh, and in terms of organization, literally what you have is organization first under, under the military and soldiers, right? And so this is very much about Isaac's point about the role of violence at the edge of empire in some areas where you don't necessarily have a field. Um, but then later under, under bureaucrats in the Bureau of Land Management. And so there is this sense of being organized out. And here I'm reminded uh, uh, you know, Eric Olin Wright, when he talks about sort of oppression of different people in the United States, the distinction between Black Americans uh, versus sort of American Indians, and the difference between, in a sense, being removed from the capitalist project in the United States versus being systematically oppressed under capitalism. And so these are two different forms of othering, uh, but have imp important implications for how we understand what is, what is going on. And so that would be my answer to the other, you know, who, who is being othered here. Uh, as far as the question about sovereignty, I think that I would um, sort of distinguish between um, the role of, you know, referring to the people as a sort of a, a form of, um, as, a, as a sort of rhetorical strategy for legitimating rule versus actively involving people, right? And these are very different things. And these are things that are radically incomplete in the U.S. case, as we often treat, um, you know, like we, we've seen this recently when we say, you know, the U.S. is not a democracy. It's, a, you know, federalist you know, republic. Right. So basically, we actually have this language for denying people the right to actively be involved. And so it gives us the notion of a republic gives us recourse to, yes, this is justified and there's popular sovereignty while simultaneously denying people to actually engage in, in political, engage with political voice. And so what's happening um, is you know, have incomplete democratization over the course of the 19th century. When we get to the populist moment, there's attempt to actually reform political institutions through innovations like the initiative and the referendum, which are designed not to just have popular sovereignty as a form of just, justifying decisions, but to actually create a mechanism for allowing regular people to have voice in the system. All right, Adam, I think you uh, perfectly stuck the landing because I have 129, uh, which means we have just enough time to remind you before closing our uh, flash talk today of our next couple of flash talks. There is one that's gonna be coming on in March that's still under construction, but on Friday, April 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we are gonna have Angel Parnham, who is going to discuss issues of race and national belonging with Anna Scarpellis as a discussant. So I uh, hope to see you all there. And uh, we also promise to have a couple of our technical hiccups ironed out uh, by then. So uh, with that being said, please join me in thanking all the panelists and uh, again, uh, sincere thanks for uh, helping to make CHS at SSHA such a success. Thank you and good afternoon.